Good evening. Uh, call this meeting to order at 6.06 p.m. Welcome everyone. It's the uh, regular board meeting of September 28th. And um, I am going to display a willingness to learn and uh, we'll ask everyone a little bit of patience to uh, honor um, our usual chair, Charlie McKay, who cannot be with us tonight, who has done such incredible leadership about uh, learning the Hokuminum language. I thought that I would do my best to uh, display some learning as well, but I will also be displaying very much a lack of ego because I'm not very good at this. So, hi Sapka, Kwanas Alapska, Kiv Atanakwel, Tasia Talatash Nanemok, Mastimok Ni Hak. Bushasta Tamak Atanakwe. And that's I thank you all for gathering today. I'll like to start by giving my highest gratitude and appreciation to the people of Stanemo on whose lands we are currently meeting and acknowledge that we also serve Astanawas and Staminas in our school district and also acknowledge the uh, Metis and uh, other indigenous um, relatives that we uh, have within our communities and school districts. As well, I want to acknowledge um, that all of us are wearing orange today uh, to honor and acknowledge that in two days we have um, September 30th, the Truth and Reconciliation, Day of Truth and Reconciliation. So for those of you that are going to be watching this meeting, just want to make sure that you know about the events um, in honor of that day. Uh, and you can see that on our website or on the RDN website or on the city of Nanaimo website. We are all partnering with Nanaimo um, for Truth and, uh, Truth and Reconciliation Day. So thank you very much for all those who uh, organized uh, what looks to be a kind of really fun and amazing, um, profound uh, day long um, event. OK, uh, moving on to the agenda. Um, I we do not have any transfer of items to our meeting agenda tonight. Um, I am going to propose myself an addition to our agenda. And so uh, with the acceptance of our uh, committee here, uh, I'm going to add that traffic safety concerns be added to new business under item 12.2. Uh, if that's what oh, yeah, tr Trustee O'Neill is. Yes. Supporting that and um, Trustee Bailey is seconding that. Is all those in favor of that addition? Thank you, everyone. That's approved. Um, uh, Trustee Higginson. Great. OK, so moved by Trustee Higginson, seconded by Trustee Keller. Um, I'm comfortable with that. So if we can just go forward with the vote, can we add that to our agenda? All those in favor? All right, that would be approved. So we will add the advocacy letter under 12.3 under new business that will be later in our agenda today. Uh, does anybody have any other recommendations for the agenda, whether it be deletions or changes in order? Seeing none, I'm going to ask for an, uh, um, a motion to approve the agenda. Moved by Trustee O'Neill, seconded by Trustee Berzovich. Uh, all those in favor? Everyone's in favor. The agenda is accepted. Um, now I'm going to ask for a motion that, um, and I'll just read it out, uh, that the minutes from the regular board meeting, a uh, board of education meeting held June 22nd, 2022, and the special board of education meeting held July 6th, 2022, and April, or August 31st, 2022, be adopted. Will someone move that? Thank you, Trustee Keller, seconded by Trustee Berzovich. All those in favor of approving those group of minutes? And those are approved. Thank you very much. OK. Um, uh, in section eight, we have the um, section. Sorry, in section eight, we have the section 72.3 report. Uh, is someone uh, willing to? Well, I'll read it out um, that the section 72 uh, bracket three report from the closed board of education meeting on January 20, sorry, June 22nd, 2022, and the special close, meet, close board meetings on July uh, 6, 2022, August 31st, 2022, and September 14th, 2022, be received. Moved by Trustee O'Neill, seconded by Trustee Wilkinson. All those in favor? And that has passed. 
Uh, on to announcements. We have um, on education meeting October 5th, 2022. We have our business meeting October 12th, and we have a board of education meeting on October 26th. As well, we've got, as I already mentioned, the, the statutory holiday uh, for the National Day of Truth and Reconciliation on September 30th, and um, Thanksgiving on, it's a little bit interesting that those go together, on October 10th, 2022. For uh, your information as well, we have uh, two non-instructional days for the month of October, October 21st and 24th. We also have a presentation this evening, so thank you very much. Um, we have presentation from the Randerson Ridge Elementary School Traffic Committee and Jessica Pompey, Popin, po you tried to tell me, sorry. Popin is here to present to us, so thank you very much, and I'll just, uh, I'll let you take over here. Sure. Uh, thank you very much, and thank you for allowing me this opportunity to come and speak to you. For me, it was um, pretty short notice, so I'm really excited to actually be here, that it just, everything fell into place. So uh, as introduced, my name is Jessica Popine. I have lived in the city of Nanaimo for the past five years. I was transferred here along with my family. Um, five years ago, we we're from the Lower Mainland. Originally, I have been with the RCMP since 2008, uh, where I've stepped away from that job, though, recently for the past five years to raise my kids. And now I find myself as part of the elementary world. I've been in it and fully invested in it for the past three years. I've been a member of the Parent Advisory Committee in one form of another uh, for all three years as their Emergency Preparedness Coordinator for the school. And as of last year, um, started um, along with a few other parents, a traffic committee. And where we found ourselves last year was brainstorming ideas as well as monitoring the school for a lot of the complaints that we were hearing about and came up with a proposal of an idea. Uh, a fellow mom actually had attended an elementary school in California and she said they had a fantastic program and so I dived into it, did as much research as I could and absolutely loved it. Um, it's been run throughout the U.S. at least uh, publications go back to 2007. Um, it has the gold seal stamp from all the top federal organizations it is, from my information, primarily done a lot throughout California, uh, and it's successful at taking large schools and reducing the traffic and promoting um, walking and biking. That's ultimately the goal here. And so what I propose to you today is actually called uh, the Safer School Drop-Off Zone, and I would love to speak to you further about that. So um, what I'll read to you today is just the purpose and the background and go through some of the experiences we have here at Randerson as well as what our proposal is. Uh, I am cognizant of the time, um, but uh, yeah, so I'll just kind of plow through it as best I can here because it's a lot. I'm just hoping to kind of further the conversation about it by introducing it to here today. So the purpose of the Safer School Drop-Off Zone is really to encourage and enable more children to walk and bike to school. That's our number one goal utilizing a combination of engineering, enforcement, education and encouragement strategies, communities are able to tailor this program to their specific schools. The drop off and pick up process must be safe and efficient for students and parents arriving by bus as well as motor vehicle, but also for those who arrive by foot and bicycle. Some parents today are reluctant to allow their children to walk and bike to school. This is typically because of traffic congestion and safety concerns. And so they drive their children to school, adding to the traffic congestion and adding to the safety concerns of the motor vehicles. By improving the drop off and pickup process, traffic conditions become safer for all, including pedestrians and bicycles. A better organized and safer traffic conditions will ease the concerns of parents and make them more willing to allow their children to walk. The drop off and pick up process requires coordination. Local government officials, law enforcement, school officials, parents and the general public work together. <clears throat> These are examples of situations, photographs, I've taken most of them, of situations that we have found 
at our school. These are not unique. I am sure you are well aware the schools in Nanaimo are plagued with traffic and safety concerns. I will go through these super quick. We've got vehicles stopping in bus lanes, vehicles parked on top of crosswalks, children and vehicles walking or going together, like kids getting dropped off in the middle of the parking lot and having to run through all the cars. Uh, we've got vehicles that are parked against yellow curbs on top of road markings that say no parking. Uh, vehicles that block intersections, so you're at a standstill. People on cell phones, people blocking handicap parking, people walking in between cars, and the most recent one was actually a vehicle that parked on the wrong side of the street against a yellow curb underneath a no parking sign in between two of my delineators that I had literally put there so that vehicles exiting could see if it was safe and be parked right there. That was a great one for us. <laughs> So I'm sorry, I'm just going to quick turn my pages so I'm catching up here. Using tools for the drop off and pick up process. A number of tools can be utilized to improve the safety and efficiency of the process. To go over these quickly here, um, encouraging walking bicy and bicycles, curb stripping and other so markings on the pavement, proper signage, separating motor vehicles and pedestrians, adding a drop off and a pick up lane. Assistance in California, older students open vehicle doors and allow the young children and welcome them to the school. Uh, adding off site queue lanes, you can do temporary street closures, temporary use of school grounds to help in it. Huge one education, including maps, frequent reminders through school announcements and newsletters. And then the last one is always monitoring the enforcement of the drop off and picnic pickup process. Our proposal today, me, we're proposing, well, we have five goals. One, to increase the number of students that are walking and biking to school, to improve the functionality and flow of traffic in the parking lot, reducing wait times for vehicles that are picking up and dropping off, to create a highly controlled and supervised parking lot, reducing the congestion on, for us, it is Nelson Road, but side areas. The following are the changes that we seek to implement at our school if we were to run this. The parking lot is essentially divided into five main components. I will get into those in just a moment. We must separate pedestrians from motor vehicles. We cannot have a parking lot, fill it with cars, and then ask the children to go and find mom and dad or the parent. Modernization and refreshment of curb markings, road markings, and school signage. Through the city, we seek do not block intersections in front of our entrance and our exit onto Nelson. We ask rumble strips to be installed along there. So vehicles entering the school zone hit that rumble strip so they have a heads up, they're coming to a school zone. And improved uh, modernization of the school zone signage to minis current Ministry of Transportation guidelines. Ours are already behind what a current new building school would receive. Improved school zone signage, and I would like to see even what Qualicum Beach has, which is solar flashers, and it posts the speed your speed is for cars that are entering our school zone. The following I'm going to have to go through quite quickly to be respectful of your time, but you all have this information in front of you. This is the park parking lot redesign. This purple zone would be restricted teacher and guest only. We use combs, signs, delineators, whatever is needed to advise the parents you cannot park or even enter this zone. It is teacher and guest only. Parent and guest parking lot. 36 parking spots are designated for parents and guest only, but for parents, it's really priority for little ones kindergarten, grade one, where the parent is actually required to be present to even receive the child. So we have signs that just say, please be respectful and leave this space. It's not mandatory, it's just to be respected. We have a bus and emergency vehicle access only. To date, if you were to go to my school and try and get a fire truck or a police car up to the doors of the school during pick off, pick up, you would not be able to get a vehicle into there. You could not get a fire truck or a police car in there or an ambulance. So if there is a medical emergency, say even a child was struck by a vehicle in the parking lot, we would have to either have paramedics run 
in or we would have to physically remove that child out to get medical attention. Uh, <clears throat> pardon me, a safe drop off pickup zone. This is the bread and butter of what we're really looking at here. And I will uh, leave you to really examine it. Really what you're doing here is using cones. Vehicles are entering the parking lot. They're being filtered and funneled through into a, a drop off pickup zone. Um, adult supervision is, is keeping them moving. In the states they can run this program, it's 45 seconds. From the time you enter, the time you get your kid, and the time the next, your vehicle has to be moving along. So kids need to be ready to go. Parents need to be ready to go. There's a whole art to it. And in your package, you'll see all the list of rules. But that's where education and enforcement come in, how to run this properly. A safe student waiting area. So when children are waiting for to be picked up, they are behind. Um, there's actually a fence there. Uh, they could climb through it if they needed to. But someone would, you know, you would see mom arrive, the child leaves the safe waiting area, gets on board the vehicle and the vehicle can depart. Separation of pedestrians and motor vehicles, like I said, no kids enter the red zone. It's just not safe. And here in your package, you will see a very overview of what that really looks like for everyone here. Um, so I do ask, take, take a minute, go through it. Um, but that's really what we're looking at creating. As we move to the next page here, um, this is a really important one. The pictures on the left here, what you're seeing are the current signs. They're probably 10 years old and they're what you will currently find at Randerson Ridge. To describe it really frankly to you all, it it's honestly like a, someone took a jiffy marker and went to a sign and was like, no parking. Like it's very, the font, the lack of arrows, the lack of direction. You can get signs nowadays that just have so much more information. They look authoritative. People want to follow those signs. So if you're going to do a no parking sign, like in the middle one, well, no parking where? Right in front of the sign? What about right beside the sign? Where if you move to the signs on the right, well, it clearly indicates no parking to the left of this sign. If you're going to do a bus loading zone, it means there is no parking and there is no stopping. Be very clear. We need to be very direct with people what we want them to do and what we don't want them to do. And so that really is a modernization of what is currently at the school. These are examples of what Randerson really looks like. It's really um, like there's small no parking signs, worn yellow curbing, small exit signs. I'd really like to see those made big and bold. So Vehicles don't go on top of them, parking on top of or stopping on top of sidewalks. You can just really add a lot with uh, visuals. I apologize, I've gone over. I will speed this up here. Improvements along Nelson Road. Again, what we're looking for from the city, some no blocking areas so that traffic can continue to move freely throughout the area. School markings along the pavement aid along with rumble strips in helping vehicles to know that there is a school zone and to slow down modernization of the school signage to Ministry of Transportation and ICBC signage. Um, and then it leads us into education. How do we roll that out as parents and as a traffic safety team? Um, there's a few different things we can do. I will go over them quickly here, my apologies. So education is essential. It, regular reminders from the school, maps with traffic flow patterns are helpful. The school can hold traffic safety days. Tra children can be rewarded. Um, such as stickers or pencils for, for following the rules or, or making sure they walk or bicycle. We can really push it. And monitoring and enforcement of this is done through parents. The school may have a very small role, but our teachers are so overworked with this. This really does need a core group of parents that can run something like this dedicatedly, like myself, for the next seven years. I'll be out there running this program, working with enforcement, and we, we will use law enforcement. It helps, um, you know, you're not issuing tickets, but you're doing gentle reminders with using the RCMP, with using bylaws, having them there in an educational way only um, to start educating people about what the new rules are and creating a culture change of how we drop this off, um, of how we make this change, sorry, for the school. That is it, that is my uh, presentation. Don't suppose there's a question or anything out there. Other I was just going to ask if you would mind staying. I, I know we already have two people on our speakers list. No, sure. um, we have three people on our speakers list. Is there anybody else that wants to be added to the speakers list at this time? OK, of course, you can add yourself later. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, Trustee Keller here.
Thank you for your presentation. Um, I have to just acknowledge the fantastic job that the uh, committee has done. I, this is very professional um, and I think uh, it really demonstrates a bigger issue that we face throughout the district at all of our schools, I would say, at a systemic level. Um, this needs to be done for all of our schools. <laughs> so thank you for that. Um, I'll, I will lead to a question. Um, so who is on the team? I'm curious because a lot of this stuff uh, is right out of our sort of planning 101. This is what we want to see in terms of active transportation, safety, signage, road markings, access. So those are all the things that are good planning practices. So do you, who's on the team? I'm just curious. Myself, I am team lead on it. Um, I do work, um, actual full name, Stephanie Schwager, Tara Wren, um, a new lady, Janice Larson just joined, um, another lady I haven't met in person yet. Um, oh, Mark gets so upset with me. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's my moment there. Mark Robinson, though, not as actively involved at this time. Um, but yeah, so it's just a small group. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm just going to assume you went back on that list there, Craig. The, okay, you look like it. Sorry. Um, Trustee O'Neill. Hopefully I did that right. <laughs> um, well, I just want to say I love your enthusiasm right off the hop. Your, like, your presentation was awesome. Lots, um, you know, Pretty much what Greg said. I mean, this is a great document. It's in line with, you know, our active transportation, our safety goals, um, and you know, <laughs> a significant amount of work and resources put into this. Um, so I'm, I, I really want to thank you. I had, you know, volunteers, staff, you know, who else was, um, you know, a part of this process. You, you let us know that, and. Um, yeah, I think it's something that we need to seriously consider, uh, not just in for this particular school, but for other schools. And often we do that by starting mm -hmm. off with one school, right? Yeah. So thank you. Thank you. Um, uh, Trustee Higgins. Thank you. Thank you. I echo the uh, com comments from my, my colleagues. This is uh, really informative as somebody who lives on the street of a school that's a lane and a half wide and has almost 400 kids at it and whose child also goes to a different school, I see what is um, a complete disarray in one school and another school where our students are all driven, where it's like smooth, smooth. Uh, so I agree. <laughs> with your comment that Nanaimo is plagued with traffic concerns. The schools in Nanaimo are plagued with traffic concerns. Uh, my question actually is, has the school principal been part of this process as well? And how do, you know, how are they feeling about, because it's it's a lot of work that you're proposing and I do appreciate the idea that you're going to be there for seven years. Um, but I've also seen various not to this level, like, uh, you know, school community projects, community gardens, for et cetera, where somebody leads it and then after a couple of years they're gone. So. How are they feeling about this amount of work and, and have are they have they been part of the process? Uh, yeah, Mr. Brick has been included in this process. Um, we first presented this to him um, last year. Unfortunately, our field was at that time set to be ripped up. And so there was a great deal of concern that we just couldn't implement anything. So um, we definitely hit pause to it. Um, this opportunity we knew we wanted to kind of bring this back around but I wasn't sure how we were going to do it or um, so we've I've since had another meeting with Mr. Brick and um, there are concerns um, which I think would be echoed through many other schools about the level of volunteerism a program like this would require as well as um, just even teacher support to get the ball rolling I believe the program is designed to eventually require little support. I believe that this is a culture change. Um, if I may share, uh, 
a kind of story of in perspective to this. There's a school that they use across the states, but it's in Brampton, Ontario. 870 plus children attend the school and it's only a K to eight. Um, they wanted to reduce the number of vehicles because over 90% of the children were being driven to school, which is a huge number of vehicles. And so they began to roll out a program similar to this with more of a huge push towards children walking though. Four years later, um, they have a 25 a day tally that they do. They receive 25 vehicles on school property to drop off children can be done and it can be done in a short period of time. Four years is enough for something like this. Um, I think when it's rolled out, uh, we need to make it a big deal. We need to have videos. We need to have like all the hoopla. The RCMP will be there, the bylaws will be there. It will have the community's attention to it. It will be a wonderful program that can be rolled out and um, to all the schools of Nanaimo eventually. Um, and for that, we will have volunteers, I believe. I believe people will want to be part of something like this. And as parents begin to see how it operates and how it kind of feeds itself, maybe we don't need 18 parents standing out about there being like, you need to move along, get in your car. Drivers, don't leave your vehicle. The signs can do that and, and we start to reduce those numbers, but it will take time for that. So for that, I know I, I can share and express his concerns with a program like this and just, well, what exactly is this really going to look like for volunteers? Um, but I think when I when I shared it with him, like honestly, we sat down, he and I, the other day and I said, okay, this is like, I'm going to read this to you. Like, this is what we've created. And he would go, oh, oh, that's, oh that's a really good idea. And then you go, okay, show me the next page. Oh, I love that. Yeah, that would work. So the more you learn about how this operates, it's the same for you guys, right? Like hearing it, it's like, oh, this is, this is actually, it works. It's in line with active school travel. It's in line with city of Nanaimo, what we're moving forward with. It's a great program for that. And so I think that's where we're going to really see our buy-in. Yeah. So we're limited on time and I do have two other trustees uh, who would like to speak. So Trustee Berzovich, you are next. I'll be super quick, thank okay. you. Okay. Yeah, I think this is a great proposal. I have a now 20 something cousin who used to go to that school I used to pick up for her. I, I know what this parking lot is like. The one thing I guess I would suggest that we consider if we look at doing this is right now there is a Wheelchair spot, if I'm reading the map correctly. Oh, actually, wheelchair accessible, you're correct. There may only be one. No, I mean the one in, in the purple zone on the, sorry, in the section 1A. I understand, yeah, in the parent teacher. Yeah, in that parent teacher zone. I I think you, you, we're going to want to just talk. That, that's never been a great spot anyway for a wheelchair park spot. So one of the things we might want to make note of is maybe we want to move that or change that a bit because how, what would the implications of for all that be. You're correct. There are two um, just to the other side of it. Yeah. Um, and those will remain unobstructed at all. Okay, times. good. And yeah. with the right um, monitoring through the volunteers, they will be, um, we usually know who the who the people are that need those spots, but those will be that 100% guarantee those have to remain unobstructed okay. at all times. Yeah. yeah. Thank you. And uh, <clears throat> Trustee Bailey. Yeah. My understanding that that would be the school district. It's once you get onto Nelson, your city of Nanaimo, uh, Ministry, uh, Ministry of Transportation, or the Transportation Department for the city. But once you step onto school property, it's full school board. Right, yeah. yeah, our property is our responsibility, but the roads are. Depend if they're in the city, the city. Thanks. So I'm I'm going to thank you for your presentation. As everyone else said, it's it's excellent. Um, and uh, I also thank you for um, lighting a fire. We already have an active transportation plan as far as our long range facilities plan. It's part of our upcoming environmental stewardship action plan. Um, so your timing is excellent. Uh, synergistic, I would even say about uh, how we wanted to move forward. So 
I think you're giving us a bit of a nudge. So I want to thank you for your time. Very appreciative. I see thank Trustee you. Keller. Yes, um, I'm going to say this is the, just let me this is thank you and this will be the end of the presentation. We're going to accept the motion. You're welcome to stay, but I understand that you have children at home as well and we are online, but um, I do very much appreciate for your your high quality presentation. So thank, thank you. you very much. Yeah. And uh, Trustee Kelly, you have a motion suggestion, please? Yes, thank you. Um, just following the presentation, I'd like to move that this item be moved to new business for discussion. OK. Uh, is there a seconder for that? OK, uh, Trustee Robinson. OK, did you want to motivate that? Uh, yeah, briefly, I, I just think. Um, this is such a great assessment of the condition of the school and uh, um, a plan that it deserves some attention. And, and I think to do that properly this evening requires us to move the item to this to new business for discussion. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, OK, I'm ready to, to move on that. If everyone's ready to vote as all those in favor. OK, so that's you know, what we're going to do then is uh, move that to new business and that'll allow us to have a conversation about it and ask questions of staff because I, I know I have a question for staff about this um, so we can have a further conversation on all the information that you brought forward to us. Great. Thank so, you very much. Thank you very much. OK, moving on uh, under correspondence, we have um, from the BCTF, the BCTF uh, funding um, brief from 2030. Uh, I've got a motion here that the Board of Education of School District number 68 and Nanaimo Ladysmith receive and file the correspondence from the BCTF. Is someone willing to move that motion? Trustee Higginson, seconded by Trustee O'Neill. All those in favor? Any opposed in that? OK, I see three in favor. I need you all to participate. <laughs> OK, all those in favor? Great, everyone's in favor. Thank you very much. Um, I know online we're used to different, but uh, we're going back to the original stuff. OK, so that passed uh, for receive and file uh, item 12 or sorry, 11.2 before and after school care. A uh, couple of letters. Um, the motion is that the Board of Education of School District number 68 and Nanaimo Ladysmith refer the above correspondence before uh, regarding before and after school care to the board chair. Uh, that would be Trustee McKay for clarity uh, for a response. Can I get a mover on that? Trustee O'Neill seconded by tr uh, Trustee Bailey. Uh, all those in favor? Thank you very much. So that has been um, approved. Uh, uh, 11.3, um, we have two pieces of information or correspondence from Minister Whiteside, one with regards to the Student and Family Affordability Fund and others with regards to housing for school, school district employees. So the corresponding motion is that the Board of Education of School District number 68, uh, Nanaimo Ladysmith, receive and file the correspondence from Minister Whiteside. Uh, moved by Trustee McKay, seconded by Trustee Wilkinson. All those in favor? Yes, that is. Trustee Keller? And Trustee Wilkinson. OK, thank you. Wow. <laughs> I'm so glad that my colleagues will support me in correcting my behavior. So thank you. Um, and that was passed. Um, moving forward on more correspondence, we have several correspondence uh, items all on the electric school bus topic. Um, so uh, we're going to ask that the Board of Education of School District number 68 and Nanaimo Ladysmith refer the above correspondence uh, regarding electric school buses to the board chair for response. Uh, that is moved by Trustee Keller, seconded by Trustee O'Neill. All those in favor? And that is passed. OK, last piece of correspondence on here. Um, uh, North from the North Oyster uh, Diamond Ratepayers Association with regards to a coal North Oyster water supply um, that the Board of Education of School District number 68 and I'm a Lady Smith refer the above correspondence from North Oyster uh, Diamond Ratepayers Association to staff for correspondence. That's removed by Trustee Keller with a question mark on his face. I'm going to get a seconder. OK, by Trustee O'Neill, and I have a feeling that there's a question coming. OK, so Trustee Keller. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, I have to turn my camera on, sorry. My question is, will the board be informed about um, any potential concerns related to water quality? Because um, the, the correspondence talks about a neighboring property that had a sign posted 
relating to um, not drinking the water and it being potentially contaminated. So I want to make sure that um, if we're looking into it, that we're also being informed. So I'm not sure if we need to amend the motion or if we can ask staff to keep us in the loop. Thank you. That was my question as well. Can I ask uh, Secretary Treasurer Welsh to respond? Uh, So through you, Chair, uh, so absolutely we can send that out. Um, I can per perhaps just provide a very brief um, little bit of an overview now. And so just from our maintenance department is that the water is tested once every three months for biological pathogens and reported to Island Health. Out of the fire at Sir Steel, uh, Island Health and the Ministry of Environment mandated the water from the well supply uh, the school to be chemically tested every three months. The results are shared with Island Health and the Ministry of the Environment. Any change in the test results and the drinking water officer will contact the school district maintenance department, stop using the well and start hauling water by truck. The drinking water officer has all the necessary contact information to contact the school district maintenance department in the event of an emergency. And we, I believe we've had recent testing uh, that confirmed everything was in good order. Uh, Certainly the last tests were well within uh, the, the guidelines acceptable for continued use. And so what we'll do is we will provide the most recent testing along with our response to uh, to the folks and, and share with that with trustees, no problem. Did you want to follow up trustee Keller? Yes, please. Um, it's okay a two part follow up, or if not add me back to the list. Sure. Um, do we know that they're testing for the types of contaminants that would be expected potentially from this property. Through chair, I cannot speak to that, but I can get the I can get the answer to that. Thank you. I'm going to actually put myself on and let you come back. I don't know if anybody else wants to speak to this for the list. No. Uh, OK, thank you. Um, my question was about the timing of the tests as someone who has a well and tests water on a regular basis. Yeah. We have a motion. We have a motion, and if people want to discuss the contents of the letter, there should be a motion to refer this to new business for the conversation because the questions are getting quite detailed, I I feel. Uh, so I'm happy to entertain a motion to, to move it to new business or, but it feels to me they're getting too detailed. Trustee Keller? i like to move that this letter be correspondence be moved to new business. Okay, that's seconded. That yeah. might be the easiest because it is relate does relate to how I feel about the motion. And so that's where my questions lie. But if we can uh, feel comfortable passing the motion as is, and then if we need to uh, have another motion in new business to address those concerns, then we can do it that way. Just as another point of order on my point of order, uh, I believe that if we move it to new business, the motion uh, for passing the referral, like we, we have to deal with that, which would be, and was that motion moved and seconded? Yes, to, so we have a motion on the table. So then what I would suggest is due to the questions that are mm -hmm. being asked, okay. we, we fail that motion for now. We don't vote in favor of it because there's a number of questions regarding the content of the letter. Mm -hmm. And based on that, it gets moved to new business and then we can reintroduce a motion yeah. about how people feel. But the okay. questions are not, relevant to the motion on the table. I think what we can do is just simply refer to new business instead of failing the motion. I I will allow you to decide that as the chair. OK, <laughs> if people are comfortable with that option. Shall we uh, vote on a removal to refer to new business? So. so. Yes, Trustee O'Neill. I guess I have to put myself on. No, you don't have to put it on chat. Oh, we're in this. Oh. We're in this room. Just yeah. Oh, but my mic. That's what I meant. Yes. Yes. Okay. Thank you. I'm confused. <laughs> I'd like to ask uh, the secretary treasurer. Mm -hmm. uh, next steps. Uh, I asked you to learn with a building this now. Mm -hmm. uh, so what do you understand the question? So what would my question be? Do we 
do we deal with the motion um, that is currently, because it sounds to me like there's two motions right now. It, there's the motion um, to deal with the board of and there's the motion uh, now to refer to new business. So are we uh, speaking, and you know, there's been a point of order as well thrown in there, um, which I tend to agree with. So are we looking to pass, uh, can we go back now to the original motion, which is whether or not we're going to move this and refer it to the chair uh, to provide a response to the letter writers and ourselves, or are we going to first vote on this referral and then go back? Because I that the conundrum might be ourselves. Sure. So, um, just can I confirm that the original motion to have staff respond was uh, was seconded. moved and seconded? Sorry. So given that referral of that motion would just be the referral of the motion to a different part of the agenda. So the, the motion should be dealt with as in defeat or defer or to uh, amend. And then if the, the underlying issue is going to be wanting to be discussed as an item of new business, then that item can be raised separately if it's emerging of the circumstances. So if people are comfortable voting on the motion as is, we can entertain a secondary motion to refer or add to new business. And I'm seeking is, is are, are people comfortable moving forward with addressing the motion? And I guess we can simply address it by vote. Could, could I possibly just make a, a recommendation then if the, if the board was interested in addressing both issues, it may well be advisable to refer this motion to new business after whatever discussion is being requested about the main issue under new business as its own item. So two items to new business. Is that what you were just recommending? Yes. Okay. And or or alternatively, you could you could vote and say yes, the the staff can can respond, but we want some questions in new business to to address this as okay. well. That's also would work. And does referral require a vote? Yes. OK, so uh, that's what I'm going to move forward as is that first we're going to refer the motion because I'm not sure that people are comfortable voting currently. So I'm going to move this current motion on the correspondence when the motion will be to refer that to new business. We can vote on the motion in new business. As well as if someone wants to entertain another motion to, to discuss. I guess we could just discuss in our new business. Yeah, we're referring it. But that motion's been moved and seconded. I thought we, you just told me we could refer. Yes, you could refer. You could put a motion on the table to refer the motion that's before before the, the board right now to new business. Okay, I'll move that then. Thank you. And I'll second that. Seconded by trustors, a uh, motion by Trustee Bailey, seconded by Trustee Berzovich. Are we discussing this? Can we move to all those in favor of the motion to refer? Okay. Um, Trustee Berzovitz, Trustee Keller, Trustee Robinson, Trustee Higginson, Trustee Stanley, Trustee Wilkinson, Trustee Bailey. Uh, do you want to be opposed on that? Okay, with opposition of Trustee O'Neill. So that does pass. So we've just referred that to new business. 12 as 12.5. Make a motion to add a new item under new business. That's the new 12.5 with the referred motion being dropped to 12.6. OK, so now we're going to request another uh, if people want to discuss this issue, we need to and you need to repeat that to me that they would make a motion to refer this issue. No, sorry, not refer. Add, add this issue for discussion to new business under 12.5. For North Oyster water discussion. I'll discussion. Move that. Oh, did you get the language on that, Ms. Matthews? We got lost. <laughs> Karen's having technical difficulties right now, and the meeting is being recorded. 
I think I'll be good. Okay. I just want to make sure that everyone's clear on what they're voting on, which is to move this issue for discussion mm -hmm. into new business, mm -hmm. and that will become therefore uh, 12.5, and we're removing the referral to 12.6 after that discussion. Is everyone clear on that? That has been moved by Trustee Berzovich, yes. seconded by Trustee Keller. All those in favor? Everyone is in favor, except for I believe that Trustee O'Neill would like to be opposed on that. Thank you for that. Okay, so that has been settled. I'd like to remind the board that I had no time to prepare for this meeting. And I would appreciate some support from my fellow board members. Doing my best. Um, okay, so that is the end of the correspondence. Oh, guess what? We're at new business, everyone. Um, <laughs> Mark Walsh, Secretary Treasurer, will be able to take over for me for that on the audited financial statements. So <clears throat> thank you, Madam Chair. And with us this evening, we have uh, Lenora Lee uh, from KPMG, who uh, is the who conducted the audit. And I would turn it over to Lenora with your OK. Yes, please. Thank you, Lenora. Welcome. Thanks for having me at the meeting tonight. I just wanted to touch on a couple highlights of the financial statements, which are included in the package on page 68. In terms of the audit status, we are substantially complete and we are prepared to finalize our audit opinion upon approval of the financial statements by the board tonight. The auditor's report as drafted is a clean and unqualified opinion and it indicates the financial statements are presented accurately in accordance with the accounting standards that the ministry requires the school district to follow. There's no material errors within them, and uh, we are very appreciative of all the support from management to conduct and complete the audit process. I'll give a couple highlights of the financial statements themselves. On the statement of financial position, which is on page 74 of the package, this statement shows the assets, liabilities, capital assets, and accumulated surplus as at June 30th, 2022. Total assets of the school district were 53 million. That was an increase of about 7 million from last year. And that primarily represents an increase in cash and investments for restricted capital grants for childcare facilities to be constructed in future fiscal periods. So that money has been received in 2022 and is being expended and will continue to be expended in future years. Total liabilities were 182 million. That was an increase of approximately 26 million from last year. The majority of that relates to capital grants of 20 million that were received and not yet amortized or spent. One of the accounting policies that the ministry requires all school districts to follow is that all capital grants are recognized as a liability on receipt and they are amortized or recognized as revenue over the useful life of the capital asset it's being funded. And so included in um, liabilities is amounts related to capital grants received in previous years that will be continued to be amortized to match the uh, life and the amortization of the asset itself. Outside of that capital liability, there was some increases to accounts payable and unearned revenue. That primarily relates to some uh, invoices that are outstanding at year end for construction seismic upgrades that were in progress at the end of 2022. The capital assets of SD68 were 197 million at the end of 2022. That was an increase of 17 million year over year. It's a net value, and so there was acquisitions of 27 million and amortization or usage over time of 10 million, resulting in a net increase of 17 million. The accumulated surplus represents the total surpluses since the incorporation or inception of the school district. That totals 69 million at the end of 2022, and that was a decrease of 1.8 million year over year. 
of the 69 million accumulated surplus, that is very different than cash available to spend in that accumulated surplus includes the amounts that have already been spent on capital investments. So 69 million includes 53 million already spent on capital assets in use. There is a local capital surplus of 7.2 million and an operating surplus of 7.8 million. Of the operating surplus, 5 million is internally restricted or already spoken for in terms of uh, benefit costs to be incurred in the future, as well as purchase orders that have been committed to but not yet spent. 2.7 million represents unrestricted operating surplus, and that's about 1.8% of annual operating expenses. Overall, the balance sheet does show strong liquidity, sufficient cash on hand to pay all of the existing liabilities of the school district as at June 30th. In terms of the statement of operations, that's noted on page 75 of the package. This shows the total revenues and expenses for the year, and it is a combined statement, so it includes the operating special purpose and capital activities of the school district for the fiscal year. Total revenue was 177 million for the year. That was an increase of approximately 2 million year on year. The school district was under budget by approximately 704,000, and that was primarily just a timing on ministry capital grants and receipt of those. There was an a increase in tuition revenue and other revenue as more students came back from uh, COVID restrictions and that resulted in an increase in year-over-year -year revenue of approximately 4.8 million. Total expenses were 179 million, approximately 6 million increase from previous years, and 6 million under budget, primarily in the operating fund, and that represents primarily position vacancies in a very tight labor market. Uh, the budget to actuals this year were a little bit more challenging um, to predict and estimate budget. A number of vacancies in positions as well as uh, COVID absences were very difficult to estimate. So many school districts across the province were seeing uh, savings to budget in the operating fund and uh, primarily in teachers and education assistants being under budget and substitutes being over budget. So that was a very common trend throughout the province this year. Overall, there was a deficit of 1.7 million compared to a surplus of 2.2 million and a budgeted deficit of 7.2 million. The difference to budget was primarily again in the operating fund where uh, the expenses were under budget. The breakdown of that 1.7 million deficit was a 1.3 million operating fund surplus. All of that was invested into the capital fund and used for capital purchases. And there was a 3.5 million capital fund deficit. Uh, overall, as mentioned, the financial statements uh, do show a um, healthy position in terms of liquidity and cash on hand. Um, and uh, there were very few um, adjustments. Actually, there was none, no adjustments recorded during the audit process and no material unadjusted entries at the end of the year. Um, once again, I'd like to thank management for all of their assistance with the audit process and uh, happy to address any questions. I'm seeing none. I'm just going to thank you again for uh, your always professional and uh, clearly communicated presentations. It's reassuring that we um, have the opportunity to have our financial stated by or financial statements audited by uh, an independent body, uh, especially when they can communicate that information uh, in very plain, clear, um, non non accountant lingo. So I do appreciate this very much, and uh, I don't see any questions. So I think we are uh, going to uh, move on to a motion where we receive and approve. Uh, is, is that a question, Trustee Higginson, or you want to move the motion? OK, so I'm going to let uh, Trustee Higginson. Are you going to read this? Yeah, move this it. motion then. 
thank you, Lenora. It's always great to have you. And I also appreciate just so the public knows that the, the board had a deeper discussion on this earlier, and I appreciate the in-depth uh, information you gave to us earlier. Uh, so the Board of Education of School District Number 68 and Nanaimo Lady Smith receive and approve the 2021-2022 audited financial statements. Okay, so that was moved by Trustee Higginson, seconded by Trustee Keller. Any discussion of the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? Uh, that is uh, unanimous. So that motion is approved. Uh, and I'll just thank you again, Ms. Lee. I do appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Okay, I'm hesitant. I'm I'm almost afraid. Um, the next motion is mine. And since I wasn't um, planning to chair tonight, it was supposed to be coming from me. So, board, you can either offer me the indulgence that I move my own motion, or someone will step up as chair. Trustee Keller. Okay. Okay. Okay, you want to take over? Great. Okay, so I'm passing the chair to Trustee Keller. Thank you. To 12.2 or 12.2 under new business. Uh, the challenge is you don't have this on your agenda because it's been added. So uh, 12.2, uh, Jessica Stanley, uh, traffic safety concerns. Over to you. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Um, so I did send out a motion uh, and a rationale uh, and an updated version with pictures over the email. I just want to check to see if um, board members received that one with the pictures because I do have copies if people want to have a written version. Yeah, OK, here we go. There. So um, I guess I'll move the motion and see if there's a seconder and then I'll be able to, to motivate that motion. So um, be it resolved that the Board of Education asked the board chair to write a letter to the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure acknowledging the community safety concerns in Cedar and South Wellington and asked that crosswalks used by children along walking routes to schools and to bus stops be repainted. Further, that crosswalks along Cedar at Gould Road and at Fern Road and on Holden Corso at McMillan and on Morden Road at South Wellington Road be noted as crosswalks of particular concern at this time. Seconded by Trustee O'Neill. Oh. Seconded by <laughs> Trustee O'Neill, I got that, thank you. Uh, would you like to motivate the motion? I'd love to motivate this motion, thank you. Um, so uh, roads, on uh, the management of roads is is a is an interesting and unique beast uh, in rural areas that are in a regional district, and it is vastly different than it is in the city. So in the city, you have people, um, councillors, mayor that are elected um, and that are held accountable if the city's management of public works is not being addressed or problematic. Um, in the regional district of Nanaimo. Um, the management of roads is in electoral A, but in, in electoral areas, it's handled by the Ministry of Transportation and Infrastructure. So it is it is managed by the provincial government and they uh, contract out the maintenance of roads um, to a private business. And so although community members are, I mean, first off, this is really confusing when you have an issue in the community, but second off, commuters can and have called the private company that's responsible for the maintenance under the provincial government for managing the roads in the regional district, just to give you an eye about how confusing it is. But what I've realized is that the schools in these communities are different than the schools in the city, and they don't have really the same protections or oversight with regards to roads and therefore road safety. So, um, they're they're fundamentally the traffic safety concerns are are different because of that uh, context, if you will. So, um, what's happening in in these areas is that the, the crosswalks are not regularly maintained. And I did um, I did share some pictures of the community uh, the, uh, the pictures from the community. And at first, um, I've got the first page. Sorry, I didn't number the pages. There are pictures of the sidewalks. Uh, crosswalks that are the painting is coming off 
if you can see the speed limit on that road um, that connects to the road that is on Cedar Elementary, you can see it's 60 degrees or sorry, 60 uh, kilometers per hour as the speed limit and that the crosswalks are in, aren't in great shape, um, although at least you can see them there. I will tell you that they show up a little bit better on camera than they do in real life. Um, on the second page of pictures, the picture number one that is on top, it's called Holding Corso, um, and you can't see the crosswalk. And that's from as if you were driving up. There's literally, you know, you might see a tiny bit of white paint, but it that's about that's all there. And then finally in South Wellington, the two pictures, that's the same uh, intersection just taken from two different places. That is where our kids walk to take the bus in the morning or one of the main bus stops for South Wellington. And as you can see that the, the crosswalk exists where the cars don't drive at the very side of the road, but otherwise it's gone from likely from the cars driving over it. So at the core, um, Crosswalks aren't ma maintained. There's no sidewalks, uh, or very rarely. There's generally no sweet, or street lights when it gets darker. So it's just less, um, there's more safety challenges. And um, kids often walk along the side of the roads or the shoulders. So I'm just asking us to um, acknowledge that there's challenges in um, rural areas uh, that are outside of city boundaries as well. The relationship with the RCMP is different. And there's fundamentally one member that is assigned, you know, regularly to the area. So that's a real challenge too. Um, it's just not there to monitor or enforce speed limits. So I'm asking us um, as the um, school board to say, you know, what we've heard from parents. It was in a packed letter a while back. Uh, the community's really been talking about this. I'm just asking us to bring it forward and say um, that there's some concerns. We're acknowledging those community concerns that have been expressed. I hope you can see them in the pictures. And that is why I'm asking for us to write a letter to the Ministry of Transportation to um, just address the safety a little bit by repainting those crosswalks, please. Thank you, Trustee Stanley. <clears throat> Any questions, comments on the motion? Trustee Higginson. Thank you, Trustee Stanley, for your motion and your very detailed rationale and introduction. Uh, I just, you know, to add a little bit to this, I'm sure that there is a bureaucratic reason for this, but I live on the street and they painted the stop line recently, two days ago, and not the crosswalks. And so it is quite a concern and, and it's it's come up a lot. It comes up a lot on the, the Facebook community Facebook page and it's been brought up by num like rounds and rounds and generations of parents have tried to work on this and there's a lot of hot potato on this. So I just think it's, uh, you know, this is of no cost to the board and it just sort of helps highlight that there should be a little bit more coordination in these areas uh, on, on schools. Thanks. Hearing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor? Trustee Higginson, that's unanimous. Thank you very much. So thank you, Trustee Higginson, or not Higginson, sorry, um, Trustee Stanley. I'll pass the chair back over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and so moving on to 12.3, we have uh, Trustee Higginson who wanted to bring forward a, an advocacy letter. So Trustee Higginson. Thank you. I'd like to move that the Board of Education of Nanaimo Lady Smith write a letter to the Minister of Finance and the Minister of Education and Child Care to request that boards of education receive funding to support compensation raises for principals, vice principals, senior leadership and exempt staff in the same way the provincial government provides funds to support negotiated wages, wage increases for unionized staff. We have a seconder with uh, Trustee Bailey. Um, discussion? Would you like me to motivate it? Yes, please motivate. Uh, okay, the the reason, uh, well, this is an ongoing issue where the board is not funded for exempt staff and um, and leadership uh, compensation raises. Uh, that results in us having to make some tough decisions uh, for folks who really, really deserve to have uh, their their compensation increased. Mm -hmm. uh, most recently, we've seen the the provincial mandate has been released, and these are big numbers. Um, and they're, they're, it's the right thing. Like this, the cost of living is expensive. They should be big numbers, but it's it's going to result in us having to face some, make some tough decisions. And uh, you know, without providing necessary raises, we end up in a situation like we were in a few years ago, where we have compression, where we have some of our unionized staff members 
making more money than the people who are overseeing their work. Uh, and we've only just finally been able to get out of that in the last few years. Um, and we don't want to see ourselves back into that. And, and also without being able to provide the necessary wage increases, it becomes a recruitment and retention issue for already hard to fill positions. Uh, and I think the timing of this letter is important and emergent because uh, the, the provincial budget's being composed now and it needs, so we need to get the letter in now. So thank you very much. Thank you, Trustee Higginson. Any other comments or questions? Seeing none, I'll call the question. All those in favor of the motion? And that's unanimous and passes. So thank you very much. Uh, moving on to item under new business 12.4, which is Randerson Ridge Safer Schools Drop Zones. And we're going to um, uh, hand that off to uh, Trustee Keller to speak to that issue. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> Excuse me. So I do have a motion. Perhaps uh, I could read the motion and if I get a seconder, I can motivate it. So the motion reads as follows that the Board of Education of School District number 68 and I'm a Lady Smith request staff to review the Randerson Ridge Elementary School Safer Schools drop off zone submission and provide an action sheet to the business committee outlining the potential next steps to consider in implementing the proposed changes and achieving the Randerson Ridge Elementary School Parent Advisory Committee traffic team's stated goals. And that is seconded by Trustee Higginson. Okay. Um, is that a question there, Trustee? Okay. Um, yes. So, Trustee Keller, would you like to motivate? Yes, please. Um, so, I think where I'll start with this is uh, what we, what I think, what we saw this evening was a representation of what's happening across our district, where we have schools that um, perhaps weren't always planned out in the best way uh, in terms of utilization of the space for parking and internal traffic flow. We have uh, significant increases in student population over the years. And as you know, a lot of our schools are aging, so perhaps we're, we're built at a time when, um, you know, parents felt more comfortable sending their kids to school walking and or cycling. I think uh, I'd be I'd be surprised if it weren't so that um, the share or mode of transportation now is significantly shifted towards students either being uh, driven and or bust. So I don't I'm not surprised by this and it's a, a bigger issue. Um, but I, I what I will say specifically to this motion is that this is a first step. It allows us to have our staff provide some input and uh, provide that information with some recommendations as terms of next steps for us to consider at the business committee level. Uh, most likely we're probably going to need some professional involvement at some point. Um, a lot of great ideas here. I'd also love to see how the professionals would tackle this in terms of engineering, traffic flows, site utilization, what might be possible utilizing some of the spaces that we have already on site. Um, because I think this is great work and I, and I I also think that moving this to the business committee is potentially a really good pilot project for us in moving towards the greater goal of our uh, long range facilities plan uh, recommendation 21, which is creating an active transportation plan. So I think we just really need to start somewhere and build off the success of a school. And um, just in recognition that this is a very uh, significant piece of work that was done very well and involved a lot of this school community that I'd like to move this forward to the business committee. So thank you. Thank you. And uh, Trustee O'Neill, was that a question from before or comment? Yes, please. Uh, thank you, Jessica. You're doing a great job. Last minute job. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, I want to uh, support this motion for many of the reasons that uh, Greg has outlined. Um, and just, you know, in, in sort of different terms from my, my perspective, it was planned in a way when perhaps, and most of us know, there were a lot more um, active means of transportation. When I went to school, for example, more walking, 
more busing. And I think, you know, we're trying to get trying to get back to that place it makes sense for as Naomi uh, reminded us as well for our environmental stewardship uh, goals as well. Um, so I support this um, motion most importantly because uh, when the speaker was here to present, many of us were asking the question about, you know, who was involved in this process and, and you know, the great work and research that had gone gone into it but one of the reasons I think this is really well placed at the business committee level is because that's where we have some professional involvement of our staff team um, of our um, partner groups of DPAC of uh, the NDTA of uh, QP um, who will all be involved in a cross district um, <coughs> approach and plan like this so it makes sense that we able you know have that opportunity to consult at that uh, broader table um, to present what is the uh, you know, a great start to a potentially awesome program across the district. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Trustee Higginson? Actually, sorry, I'm going to take Trustee O'Neill's lead and move to first names because maybe that'll help us change the tone a little bit. <laughs> Stephanie, <laughs> would you like to comment on this? I would like to comment on this. Um, I uh, support the motion and I support the motion and I'm, I have to say I, I'm disappointed. I'm disappointed because when we made the very hard decision to close Rutherford, we knew that there were going to be issues at the following the schools that were most impacted by it. And so far what I've heard is problems from Frank Nay, despite copious amounts of planning. I'm now hearing about problems at Randerson and that upsets me that when we like put those, we, we asked, we, you know, this was part of the overall plan and the closure and the reallocation and funding was put put towards this to develop plans. And so um, I, I don't know what happens when we have all of the plans and then they don't come to fruition. So it, it's, I, I'm, I'm disappointed that we're at this place that it's had to take this level of detail and involvement from the community. This is a really amazing amount of work. I don't want this to get lost. So I do hope that this is looked at not just from the, the view of one school, but the presenter did say that schools in Nanaimo are plagued with traffic concerns. And there are, there are other examples across the province of districts that have uh, you know, traffic safety plans around their schools. And while what happens on the roads in front of our schools isn't re our responsibility, what happens on our school grounds is. And we really do need to start taking a, a more a proactive approach to this, I believe. Uh, and it's not everywhere. I have to say, I just switched schools. My son just switched schools, and I didn't need any. I didn't need any tutoring. I didn't need any notice. I didn't need anything. I rolled into that school completely freaked out about what drop off would be like, and it was very clear to me what I needed to do and how I needed to do it. And I was in and out of that school in you know 27 seconds or something ridiculous. I don't know, maybe 46, like the presenter said. So there are very good examples around our district of where it's working, and I encourage us to talk to those schools about how they did it and how they made it. Um, legacy so that it doesn't require people. There's not one person standing out there, you know, telling people what to do. There's lots of staff telling, you know, doing supervision of students, um, but no one's telling people what they need to do and how. So it's possible. We just, we really do need to, I think, take a broader look at this. Thank you. Uh, is there any other comments on the motion? Uh, I'm, I'd just like to speak to this as well. Uh, I am going to say that uh, I'm in favor of this motion. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to bring it to business and receive some information about this issue. Um, uh, because not only because it's an issue at this school, but it's an issue across. And I believe that uh, uh, I've heard Seaview and I've heard we know a coal North Oyster. So we're getting from north to south in that situation. Um, and so I think there's some really uh, valuable information that we can um, ask staff to dive into and we can receive and this helps us move forward in our active transportation plan. Uh, we've heard over and over again and I can tell you uh, what I'm seeing as well in our old schools and why I asked for the previous motion is that when parents feel that their children are unsafe, they're more likely to drive their kids. And so um, these uh, concerns um, undermine what we're trying to achieve. So I'm glad that we're going to, uh, well, at least I'm going to support moving forward on this. Um, 
I'm going to call the question, seeing that there's no other comments. Uh, all those in favor of the motion? And that again is unanimous. OK, and so passes. So thank you very much, um, Trustee Keller, for bringing forward the motion. And I would say thank you to the Randerson Ridge Elementary School Traffic Committee for providing that information. OK, so 12.5. Ready, folks? 12.5 is the issue. So we're pulling back not how we're dealing with the letter, but we're pulling forward the letter from the. Um, where is it? Uh, yeah. Thank you, Nicole. Uh, no, North Oyster Diamond Ratepayers Association and really talking about the issue of water at that school. Uh, this is an opportunity to, I guess, ex uh, discuss the issue before we decide how we want to move forward in the correspondence. Trustee Keller. Just to so I don't mess things up again. Uh, is this the time to ask questions about the issue itself? That was our intention. OK, perfect. Yeah. Can I... Yes, please. OK. So just building off my previous comments oh, I don't have my camera on my apologies. Um, maybe through the chair to staff. Are there any concerns here around the potential for contamination around of our water source? And what would the potential cost be if there our source was to be contaminated? Because hauling water is not cheap. So um, through the chair, thank you for the question. Um, as noted, we have been in contact with the appropriate folks that are in charge of the specific water issue associated with fire at the site, and the testing has resulted in uh, the water being deemed to be safe. Uh, just just to note, so trustees are it's on the agenda now. Uh, we also um, look at the water ourselves on a monthly basis, but that's not for lead or other types of those types of metallic. We look for salmonella and other types of pathogens. Um, I would have to ask trustees to put the item on the agenda for business to get a costing um, for bottled water. Sorry, I, I just so sorry. Like to truck water in, it would be the question. I would need to get. I would need to take that away and and uh, get, ask staff uh, to gather that information to bring back. Yeah. So I'm gonna go to Trustee Keller and follow up, but I think a clarification of that. Yeah. Yeah. No. I, sorry. Through the chair, I, I'm not asking you to go and get you know an estimate. I was. I guess I'm. I'm really um, just expressing some concern that we be cautious um, and perhaps even write the property owner a letter to let them know that we are concerned um, because water, once it's contaminated, it can be very difficult to deal with. So um, I'm just not sure how seriously we would need to take this uh, because once it shows up in our water, I think you know there could be some implications there for us. Uh, just just briefly to say, just to be very clear, the district has taken this issue extremely seriously until since the time of the fire and have been working with the appropriate jurisdictions for testing. Uh, I do not believe, but I would again have to come back to, to determine whether we've issued any formal letter to the property owner with respect to the water. But uh, again, I think we've been relying on our partners um, in government and other government jurisdictions. So. Um, Again, I'd have to confirm. I don't believe that we've we've issued anything to the property owner. Thank you. Uh, so we have myself and two other speakers on this list, and I'm, I have myself next because I believe it was when I was speaking that things all fell apart here. So let's get back to where we were. Um, Mike, I I have a question, but I'm going to explain why. So in the letter, I I feel. Uh, not sufficiently informed to respond to the to the situation, and yet, in theory, it could be said because it's a significant concern. And so, while I read this letter and they talk about um, the issue being associated, at least how I read the letter about tortures, and I frankly don't know what that is. Um, but the signs talk about wild tortures present. So I interpreted that 
as a, a separate activity not related to the fire that may be associated with the concerns identified, which would be inorganic lead poisoning or poison to a previous question. So what I wanted to ask was um, if testing has a has occurred since the time if we have a date of whatever this is <laughs> occurred, I was wondering if we know if we've tested the water since that issue, if that assuming that's the issue that causes concern, have we tested since then is my question. Does that make sense? Still on. Um, through to you, uh, Chair. So uh, the test, I actually have the test from May with um, in my inbox. Um, I do not have a test from August, um, but we have not had concerns raised. So as noted, it's an every three month procedure. Mm -hmm. I can't speak to the date that they're speaking of in this letter. Um, so perhaps then um, I would recommend that perhaps it's put on the business committee if the if there's additional information required. Again, we're following the direction from the Ministry of, I believe I noted it was water on, on this. Uh, Probably Ministry of Environment now. The results are shared. Oh, so yes. And then the results are shared with Island Health and the Ministry of uh, Environment and the drinking water officer uh, contacts us. So I, I mean, certainly perhaps if the board is interested in more information on this, we would request that perhaps something is bumped off the business committee agenda and something is, this is added in this place. Okay. Thank you for that information. Um, trust, sorry, Naomi was next on the list. Yeah. Uh, thank you. I think, um, Mark, you answered uh, my question, which was, I do know that when there's been contamination, um, oil contamination as an example, uh, out in the um, rural areas, um, I know a government agency is uh, notified and there's a cleanup that the property owner has to actually incur themselves at their own cost. I'm just wondering if, um, this property owner that owns this steel company. Um, I'm just wondering if we if we know whether or not they've had to do any cleanup as a result of that. Through you, Chair, I am not aware. Again, I'm aware that we're, our water supply is required to be tested. Um, so again, our, we've always tested it monthly. And now there's the three month test for the issues associated with such a leak. I would assume that they would have obligations to clean their property, but I can't not speak to that uh, tonight. At least. So apologies. Do you want to follow up there, Naomi? No? OK, uh, Chantal. So this is just sort of an open discussion on the topic of this letter. There's no motion or anything. Currently, yes. OK, I just want to then express. So and just for point of clarification, we have passed the correspondence to be referred to staff for a response or none of that stuff. OK. I feel really. Oh, shoot. Oops. Good thing I'm not running. OK. Uh, <laughs> did I just swear on camera? No, no, I wasn't on camera technically. OK. So here's the thing that I'm feeling really uncomfortable with right now. Maybe folks can help me out. Um, we're asking some questions about some really specific technical stuff that I don't know that any of us in this room are um, really familiar with. And I also really want to give a shout out to our secretary treasurer, who I feel is, you know, doing the best to sort of respond to some of this. And, I'm also cautious that if this is why we don't engage too deeply in these topics, because we could end up giving out some misinformation and some alarmist sort of flags. So I personally, as a trustee, would feel much better if we were able to refer this to the process of you know sending it to our staff to respond. And quite honestly, in the past, we have 
uh, been quite successful in adding to a motion to refer to staff with the chair response as our usual process for correspondence, adding an, a, an amendment that says, and please, with this one, it's really important, circle back with us or perhaps a separate motion to put on the business agenda. I'm sorry, I'm really exhausted. I'm having a tough time finding my words tonight. So I thought I'd just speak it sort of as plainly as I could, okay? Um, this is a very serious issue, issue and I don't want to minimize that. But I also don't feel that we have the capacity to make some, you know, sort of more public statements tonight on this topic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Stephanie. To be clear, because I'm a little lost, there is no motion about what we should do. Correct? Okay. I'd like to move that the Board of Education of School District Number 68 and I'm a Ladysmith refer the above correspondence from North Oyster Diamond Ratepayers Association to staff for a response and provide the board with a copy of their response. Is there a seconder? I believe many, sorry, many seconded it. I'm going to go with Trustee Wilkinson because she was most enthusiastic. Sorry, Elaine. <laughs> uh, with a seconder, I will motivate that um, this letter was written to provide information to our staff. Our staff will get the letter and act accordingly as they do. Student safety and health is first and foremost in everything they do. And so they're going to get the letter if they were unsure and they believe that it needs further action then the already copious amounts of testing we've been told is currently happening with the water, then they will do that. That's what they do, student safety. So they're going to get the letter, they're going to be made aware. And then if something, they also do you know what else staff does? If we need to be made aware of something, they bring it back to us. So it's late. We have an entire agenda to get to. And I am not, I really want to focus on the Framework for Enhancing Student Learning Report, the report we're going to hear about um, education, diversity and equity, and I think it's really important that if there is something that we need to pay attention to, that staff is able to bring it back to us in a way that is much more informed than we are able to do with tonight. So that is my reason for the motion. Thank you. Okay. Um, if everyone will just bear with me, I just want to try to pull up the letter and uh, look who CC'd on this. Um, OK, I, I'm happy to read it out. It's. Uh, someone from North Oyster from Cool North Oyster, it looks like. The PAC, the North Oyster Histor Historical Society. Um, a. Uh, sense of Place Youth Project, uh, uh, the Chief Semenis and um, a research assistant for uh, the MLA of the area. So. Uh, I beg your indulgence, but I, I wanted to see if it had been uh, CC to any kind of health authority was what I was wondering. Um, are there any questions or comments on the motion at hand? Uh, I see none. Um, I'm pausing because I'm actually considering an amendment. Um, but I'm going to have, uh, I'm not going to because I have faith in staff in, in addressing this issue and making ensuring there's no safety issues. And since we're going to be hearing back that that can be addressed. So I'm talking myself through this. I appreciate that. I'm going to move to a vote of the motion since there is no current discussion questions. All those in favor of the motion as proposed. Uh, it is unanimous. Uh, it is passed. Uh, we are done with that issue, and I believe that eliminates the need for 2.6 was whether to do how to handle correspondence. Sorry, 12.6, so how to handle correspondence. Thanks. Let's shake that one off. Water issues are scary, let's face it, and so I'm really glad that the board actually was like pausing on this. Um, we will move on, however. Uh, senior staff reports. Um, Sean, Mr. Johnson, our Executive Director of Human Resources is going to present on equity, diversity, and inclusion framework, providing us an update. Thank you, Chair. Oh, let me turn my camera on here. Thank you, Chair, and through you, Chair. Um, I prefer to be called Sean. I don't really mind, but I like to be called Sean. Um, this is just a quick update on the, the EDI framework that we're working on. Um, I provided an information sheet and a draft 
project plan. That's a living document and, and an early iteration. Um, I'll say to start that we started out calling this EDI, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion, and we've now added justice to the front of that. So we're calling it Justice, Equity, Diversity, Diversity and Inclusion, the JEDI plan. The quick background, the board had gave staff direction to move forward with this EDI work, and we put out an RFP to get a contractor to do some work helping us from an expert perspective. Um, I've been asked to, to lead ensuring that this work uh, is given significant importance and moves forward. So I've been working closely with Stephanie Johnson uh, and with a the contractor that was selected, Chanel Tai. Uh, she's an expert in this area. And we will use her expertise to get advice as we move forward. Uh, to help us develop this framework and to develop the training resources, which is really her um, significant area of expertise and interest. Um, we're proposing that this work follow the SAETSIS framework, walking together and working together with one heart and one mind. Um, that framework has worked so well for the district. This is work that, uh, regardless of where any of us is in our journey towards uh, improving this for ourselves and for the people we serve. There's always work to be done. So when we work together and gain perspectives and, and knowledge from one another, um, we believe that that will be a framework that will help us move forward. So just a quick outline of um, the th kind of the three main tasks we're looking at. I think what we need to start by doing is, is a JEDI audit take a, a hard look at where we are as a district. That work involves um, working with key stakeholders, uh, key people in the district to identify uh, their thoughts and, and uh, their views on where we are. Doing a, um, a survey district-wide, putting together and, and doing a survey district-wide uh, maybe including community stakeholders as well to to gather that information and um, and then move forward. The other key area that we looked at was policy review. Um, I believe that doing a, a wholesale review of all our policies through um, an EDI lens at this stage is probably a bigger task um, than warrants putting the resources into. I prefer to kind of flesh out a couple of the key policies we think might need um, a look through that lens, but also developing a tool that as we review or write policies, um, helps us always consider uh, how our policies affect people um, with much less power, people who are, are equity deserving and you know have systemically had less power uh, in our society. So having that tool that we can always use in, in our policy development and review uh, is what we're looking at. Um, the third component is training. We put some training ideas in that information page. Um, I think that the, the core, those are the ideas where we land, I think will be fleshed out in the stage where we're consulting with others and finding out the needs. Um, of the district. I want to make sure that we're not um, leaving any groups behind. So it is kind of a survey of of the areas. If you identify any that you think have been missed or we could add in there. Um, and I think that likely we'll find, but I'm open to finding what, whatever, whatever it is. But I think starting with ensuring that we're providing training across the district that gets people to the basic level of understanding on these issues. Uh, as an example, on, on uh, issues of gender uh, identity and expression, I want to make sure that all of our workers understand, you know, the basics of um, the Human Rights Code and what we owe each other and what we owe the people we serve. And, you know, we may have people in our district, I know we have people in our district who are working well above that level and, and hungry for, for further um, training, but 
I think likely ensuring that we're all district wide um, have the basic training might be a good focus for the first year. So that's a basic overview of, of where where we are. I have meetings set for next week and I'll likely um, will likely be meeting on a weekly or bi-weekly basis to ensure that this uh, work is moving forward. Thank you, Sean. <laughs> um, uh, I know we already have two people on our speakers list. I'm going to go to uh, Stephanie for questions or comments. Thank you. Thank you for your work on this. Uh, you and Steph J working together is a bit of a dream team. That sounds amazing. Um, I've recently heard this be called uh, start to be called equity, diversity, inclusion, and reconciliation, which might be also in a considering the CAS's framework to add in. Um, I do want to say that I think um, we are in a position. Just I'll offer this information to you know not have to reinvent the wheel on a lot of this work that. Um, our colleagues at the Burnaby School Board, the Vancouver School Board, the Surrey School Board, and a few others have done quite a lot of work on this and um, are quite willing to share their learnings, their teachings, their failings, their regroupings. Um, and also the Maryland Association of Boards of Education has developed, um, a, it's called a Lens of Equity for All Policy that's being developed. It's six key questions. So a lot of this work exists in like really good, strong work. Um, so I would encourage us to have that be part of best practices review of, of this. Um, and I did notice, and it's a, just a question. Um, it, it talked about a survey, an anonymous survey of stakeholders. And I just, I wondered if that includes um, everybody in the school community. I asked that because in Burnaby, when they did, they, they did a full school community survey it had 9,000 respondents and 11,000 written responses. And so that shows the importance of this issue to families and students in the community. And I, I just really want to encourage us to make sure that we are hearing from every voice, including uh, the students in our communities on, and in our schools on how they're, how they're impacted by this. So that's my one question. Thank you. Um, it's a good question. The intention has been to ensure that we provide voice to everyone in our community who wants voice on this issue. I think um, moving this work forward, which will be work that we're doing the rest of our careers, uh, really does require that we're working with everybody on this. So yes, the intention is to have broad community consultation. Thank you. Uh, did you want to follow up on that? No. Nope. Okay, Trustee Keller. Sorry, Greg. Greg. Either or. It's all good. Um, thank you. Through the chair. Um, thank you, Sean. Um, overall, I think it looks really good, and I, I, I look forward to this work, although I recognize that um, it's not going to be easy work. It's going to be fairly challenged, challenging, I'm sure. Um, the one piece that I'm wondering about that seems to be missing for me, though, is uh, reference to and consistency with our public participation policy. And there's a significant element of this that involves our stakeholders and community. And um, I guess it would be nice to see how our policy aligns with this because I, I don't see an evaluation of the type of engagement and tools that would be most appropriate. Thank you. Go ahead. Thank you for that question. Um, certainly appreciate the question and I'll have to look into it, but we will make sure that we are consistent with our policies. Thank you. Good. Any other comments or questions? No? Okay, um, thank you, Sean, for that update. I, I really, um, Really appreciate it. To be honest, the only regrettable thing about it is that I won't be around to uh, participate as a trustee, but I will be able to watch it from the community. And I, I think this is incredibly important work, so I appreciate your time on this. And you too, Steph J, wherever you are out there, but uh, I agree, it's a great team. 
OK, moving on to 13.2. Uh, Mark Secretary Mark Walsh, Secretary Treasurer will be talking to us about the enhancing student learning reports. Hey, so I'll be briefly just touching on uh, in the supers uh, absence on the, the fact that some of the changes that were pointed out uh, at the discussion associated with the report on the September t uh, 7th uh, meeting should be addressed in the document. And just as a reminder to uh, the board and our public that this is a document that's, be, that's required to be uh, provided to the, the ministry on a, on a yearly basis that outlines uh, some of their successes and our challenges and areas uh, that we need to focus on to address those challenges. So uh, again, just um, it following up on the September 7th uh, uh, meeting and you'll see you should, the changes should be reflected in the document that's there and it does need to go off to the ministry here um, pretty soon. And I know the deputy superintendent is here as well, so. Mark, if we need. Thank you. Um, I'm going to just see if we have questions before we move to the motion. If there's anybody wants to evaluate or sorry, uh, ask questions or comment on the report before we move to the motion. No question. Oh, question from uh, uh, Stephanie. Uh, thanks. Um, that you know, it's it's interesting. Trustee Berzovich and I attended a meeting today on the framework for something different. Uh, and I was really struck by the sharing from other districts about how they utilize not the report, because I just heard it referred to as a report, but the actual process uh, to guide conversations, learning conversations through their district. And um, we had a lot of conversations already about the data and the information when we were at the Education Committee. and. It struck me as I listened to these conversations um, and I wondered how this process or this report, but more than report, just process is is utilized uh, across our district in a way to focus or frame conversations on improving student learning and student outcomes. Yes, please. So I think as a starting point, um, when we look at the our operational plan, and the objectives and the strategies. I did nothing to prepare. Thank you. Um, as a starting point, um, when we look at the uh, operational plan with the many objectives and strategies, um, one of the things that has struck me was the the potential alignment of of this work, and I think. The two things that will be intricately sort of woven together and inseparable is this data, is this district review story, the, the, uh, the, the FESL report, and our the actual work with boots on the ground. And I know that sounds like an, something that should be obvious and that's something that is done. I think sometimes you might look at some of the documents as a make work project that we're submitting and it's something that we need to check and get done. Um, but I I think that we can bring life to this document and it can be a living document that we utilize at all levels and that we unite around. And so I think the FESL, the ESSEL uh, report uh, will be layered over the district operational plan so that they are one in the same. Uh, thank you. Um, did you want to follow up? You could. Okay, uh, Tanya? Okay. Uh, that is great for us. Thank you. 
Um, I am next on the list and I put myself twice. So if anybody else wants to go between, I, I something I realized between this version and the previous version. So sorry, I should have brought it up before, but I realized that and this is from a data portrayal perspective mm -hmm. that and we're on the same page here on, on our desks. When you have information um, presented that has subgroups, and then you compare that to uh, another number that includes all groups. I'm I, I think that's um not a great way to actually do it because the subgroup you're comparing um the number that is all students is affected by the subgroups. And so we're not actually able to compare disparity. So as much as I don't want to say like other kids or I don't, you know, like no label feels good, but we really um right now we're comparing we're confounding a comparison between the subgroups that we're looking at uh, because they're in the the group as a whole and i don't know if i'm speaking this clearly i don't having averages of all students is important too that's important data but what we don't have is um a, a separate bar graph piece of information about students that are um not in these subgroups so again i mean i don't know how we call that other for lack of a better term, that allows us for a direct comparison of disparity. And I think that's what's missing and really important here. Um, as is, if we put it in the average, then the sub the subgroups will pull uh, in this situation are pulling down the average. So we actually don't know what, how big the disparity is. So just wanted to point that out for next time about a concern um, that we need to include that piece in. Um, sorry, I didn't say it before. Um, any other? Before I go back, is there any? <laughs> um, for those of you, I well, can't, uh, Laura's camera's still on, so I guess everyone can see in theory, at least us nodding to one another, understanding <laughs> yeah. what we're talking about. Um, okay, my other question then was this, and I don't know if this is a perception in the community. I mean, I recognize there's so many challenges. I know we've talked about FSAs, and I know we come from different perspectives. But you also see in this document how limited we are in using that data because of participation rates. I'm not going to get into that issue, but what we have is a situation where on some of the information we see students and sorry, I don't have the page numbers written. Um, on numeracy and literacy poor, are performing. Quite poorly and some just really you know alarmingly concerning on some of the data that we have and maybe it's this the trend on on numeracy grade 10 you know these numbers are quite concerning mm -hmm. right but then you compare that and then following it quite quickly is the um transition rates which are yeah it is which are quite high so i actually do have the right numbers so page 159 um, and then page 160 on grade 10, we have uh, considerably like alarming rates of what is looking at numeracy assessments. And then we're talking about them transitioning from grade to grade in the next two years at extremely high rates. And so what my concern is, is that um, it relates to a community concern that we're just passing students and we're not actually ensuring that they're at grade level to pass. And so. Um, that's a narrative that we need to, I would say, explore um, and uh, explain. And so the way that the data is presented in here, that 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 taps into that narrative in a way that can address or, uh, like inflame those concerns. I don't I can't speak to whether they're accurate. Or, you know, I'm not going to speak to whether they're accurate or not. I'm just saying that's a perception out there. And so we need to make sure that students are indeed appropriately transitioning. And if they're not, their needs are being met. And if there is, you know, to whatever extent, uh, an obligation to move forward, um, that that underlying assumption around that, like the assumptions that are related to that are explored. And maybe that's at a provincial level, but I just thought it was quite alarming in the sense of the way that the data in the document was portrayed at a grade 10 level and then all of a sudden next we're talking about transitions. So I just wanted to speak to that. I don't think that has anything to do whether we accept this document as is, but it's feedback on um, the portrayal of it and the narrative that it communicates. Those are my comments. Um, Stephanie. Just to pick up on what you were talking about, and I think we did talk about those alarming rates during the Education Committee mm -hmm. 
as a as a way to explain them to the community. So we talked about that, but I wondered as you're speaking if we have the ability with the framework report because I know that th it is quite specific about the information they want. So this is sort of a two part. Do we have the ability? Do we have the ability to add grade 10 report card data for the for and I know we're trying to get away from numeracy being about topics, but there is a way to reassure the community because this could the whole point of this is to create confidence in the community that we're doing our job and these are misleading statistics because of the design of the assessment um, and because of well overall design of the assessment. Um, so do we have the ability to add another one and do we actually utilize uh, the report card data at the district level for these students to make sure that it, it isn't reflected or it's better than what's reflected in these assessments? So I'm not actually entirely sure if we can add it. I think we probably can. I, th I do know there's a limit. I do know that there's a limit of the number of pages we have to have. And back to uh, Jessica's request as well to compare or to look at disparity. It requires us to have a graph for every single subcategory, which is taking more and more room to right? right. So and that shouldn't be dictating our practice. Yeah. Certainly right with these with these documents. I think that the likelihood is we probably could add that. We just have to sort of choose what we include, what we don't include in your second question. I love that I have to turn on my microphone and you're right beside me. <laughs> Hi, Brid. Uh, was that do we, do we at the district level actually use it when we see these alarming rates? Do we go, oh, and then what do we do to, to ensure ourselves that these aren't reflective of how students are doing and so that they can transition? No, I really appreciate this question. I think you probably know the answers. At the district level, um, wholeheartedly, we are at the beginning stages of looking at this very important data at the district level, at the school based level as well, and, and looking at the interplay between the between those two activities. So we do. It is something that we've embarked upon at the elementary level and we will move forward at the secondary level as well. Yep. OK, uh, any other comments or questions on this? OK, thank you, Laura, for answering your questions. Being sandwiched between Stephanie and I is quite the challenge, isn't it? Yeah, okay. Yes, please, add a closing comment. Thank, thank you. you. I'm not sure if you're aware, but the ministry has invited districts to participate in a community of practice, evidence and data community of practice around the FESL. Mm. Um, and it uh, should be facilitated and hosted by the author of the book that we shared with you last year called Street Data. Her name is Shane Safir, but it is for senior teams so okay. district senior teams to participate in uh, a community of, of practice of, and identifying um, a, what they're calling a problem of practice around data and it's embedded within the requirements of the vessel so i submitted our application about a week ago um, and i will um, at another time if i'm invited i will share a little bit more about that and whether we're accepted or what uh, what problem of practice we'll pursue yep. which is around data it's around data for so preemptive. <laughs> so since not everyone's in the room with us, I'm going to make sure that there was a, a, a twitter of excitement. So that's great news, actually. Really great opportunity. So thank you very much. Alrighty, I believe we're. Uh, oh, we need yeah, someone to move that motion. And I think OK, so uh, that the Board of Education of School District 68 and I'm Lady Smith approve the 2021 22 enhancing student learning report to be submitted to the Ministry of Education and Child Care by September 30th, 2022. Thank you. So and is that on. seconded by Trustee O'Neill there by Chantel? OK, uh, any debate on the motion? Seeing none, all those in favor? I believe that was uh, uh, unanimous and approved, so thank you very much. Uh, OK, now on to 13.3, which is um, Mark, our secretary treasurer, talking about our policy committee work plan. Oh, thank you, Chair. So on page 166 and 167 is a memo out as well as the policies that the policy committee has discussed uh, focusing on for the 22-23 uh, year. Uh, the motion is essentially to put, put this in place, let our community and our partners know what we're going to be working on, as well as to highlight uh, kind of our focuses and how we intend to bring the work back um, to, to the board, uh, as well as out to the community as well. Uh, and so, of course, this is subject to change. Things come up and, and priorities will shift. Uh, but the idea is just for that transparency. So so folks are aware of what those priori priorities are. And you can see there's some 
there's some biggies on there um, that are going to, to take a lot of effort um, and a lot of focus and a lot of consultation, frankly. And so uh, subject to questions, uh, hoping the, the recommended motion is uh, supportable. OK, thank you. Uh, Chantel? Please, thank you very much. And that's going to be hard because I got to get my camera. Do you want me to read it out for you and you can? Well, I think. Oh, perfect. Thank you. Teamwork. Which one is it right here? I had it up on my screen. So uh, the, the Board of Education of School District number 68, Nanaimo Lady Smith, approves the policy committee work plan for 2022-2023. Thank you. And seconded by uh, Trustee Keller. Also known as Craig. Um, OK, any questions or comments on the motion? Oh, please, please do motivate. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, so, you know, I wanted to take this opportunity to mo uh, to motivate this uh, motion because um, I see it as some significant work that this board has done to uh, start to look at uh, policies. And I love that, you know, here we have, uh, you know, starting a new school year, planning out, you know, quite transparently what policies are of importance and how um, many around this table have worked on, many staff, many partners. Um, and so it's some really good work. Um, and like Jessica, I won't unfortunately be around to participate in the capacity as a school trustee, but really proud to see the work that's gone into this and the forward thinking, um, again, that many have done on this. So I fully support this. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? OK, seeing none, before we move to vote, I'll remind everyone that we created, this board created the policy committee. Um, so I do think that's something, although it's not necessarily sexy, it is significant. So I, well, I'm a policy nerd, so I think it's fabulous. Um, so this is, uh, you know, it, 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 it's a significant legacy to actually have a policy committee, which is kind of sad to say. OK, <laughs> on to the motion. All those in favor? OK, I believe that's 100% unanimous. Anyone opposed? I didn't see hands. So yes, that is unanimous and passed. Thank you very much. Moving on to 13.4, uh, which is our surplus allocation. Mark Walsh, our Secretary Treasurer, will speak to this. Uh, thank you, Chair. And so um, just in the, an evening with a few procedural uh, differences, here's another one I'm going to throw at you. So uh, there's a recommended motion associated with this memo that would actually supersede that a recommended motion that's coming from the business committee, the, the third recommended motion uh, in the business committee. So just everyone to be aware of that. So what we're what we're recommending is so we at the business committee, there was a number the the board has a as a robust surplus uh, from the end of last year uh, that have a variety of uh, pockets of dollars to, to apply them to a variety of uh, areas, including some areas of contingency that we can anticipate needing to fund. So initially we were recommending a $2 million transfer to local capital, one of which is for technology uh, kind of maintenance and repair, one of which was to put towards either LIS or ND as a contribution that we can fully expect we'll, we'll be having to make at some point. Uh, and so what has arisen, though, is we are still two days away from September 30. So that's our that's the biggest day. That's Christmas Day or, or, or depending if the Grinch comes or not. But that's the biggest day in a school district's kind of calendar from a funding perspective. So essentially, well, there's a couple of counts come a bit later. That's our main funding source is how many kids we have in the house on that day. So we've projected and we made a real point of trying to get our projections as close to reality as possible. So we weren't kind of shortchanging schools up front and then, you know, throwing a whole bunch of staffing at them in September. So our elementary has come in a smidge lower, not that bad about we again, it's good. It's going to change between now and, and September 30, which is why I don't have those numbers in the report. Around 50 to 60 kids at this point. We're still growing as a district. These are just from our projections. So of course, 60 times or 50 times 8,000, you can imagine from a budgeted amount, that's a fairly big chunk of change. 
Now, some of that comes back because some of our classes will be funded by CEF where they weren't in the past. They're funded by operating. A variety of things happen between budget and amended budget, annual amended budget. This year, however, though, rather than having some things that are going up a bit and some things that are going down a bit, we're down in, in our uh, Island Connect Ed. We are down um, in Learning Alt, but that again could change by Friday. Um, uh, we're actually up in SPED, which is um, going to, to make a lot of difference to, to this. Uh, and then the, the big challenge for us and the reason that we wrote this memo is because we're a little bit concerned about what our secondary FTE looks like. So our headcount at secondary is bang on. And so you, you'll remember that the way secondary is funded is you're a kid and you take eight courses and therefore you are a 1.0. If you are a kid and you take seven courses, you are less than 1.0. And so that funding that flows with you is a bit less. And so on whenever we sent this Monday, we were seeing some FTEs versus headcounts that were pretty out of whack with our traditional kind of percentage. So normally we see 98. We saw a little bit less um, in COVID because kids were like, oh, I can't do sports. So I'm going to graduate early and get, get out of Dodge. And so our FT went down. But we, the trend line we were seeing was we seem to be missing FTE at schools. Now, I want to give a shout out to our administrators and to uh, learning services and to financial services who have kind of put their heads together to figure out what this might be. And we've already seen a big increase in FTE even since this memo was written. So this the idea of keeping back a million dollars for additional contingency exactly. is probably just prudence at this time. We probably don't need to do this in the end, but we don't know until September 30. And so rather than transfer it and come back and say to the board, OK, can we untransfer it because we need more money to support our, our, our students? Or alternatively, let's go into schools and yank staffing that's there. Don't want to do that. Mm -mm. We go, OK, let's just put a little bit more into our contingency. Overall, I'm feeling pretty good today. And it's going to continue. And really, again, I think this experience has been great for us because I think we've uncovered some things about how we do business and how each secondary might do things a little bit different. That's really helpful for us to plan for future and provide training for, for folks when they're when they're putting kids in their classes, et cetera. So that's the kind of basis around where we're at. Overall, the, the narrative continues to be true. We are growing as a school district. It's just that we've got slightly less than we thought we would have. So that's the recommendation. So that's the, the background to why we're asking for the shift. Mm -hmm. I'd be happy to talk a little bit more about the surplus allocation, but I know we talked fairly robustly about that at business, so maybe I'll just wait for questions. Okay. Uh, is there, thank you very much. Is there any questions? Well. Okay, trust Chantel. Mark, I think you mentioned that this could be another one of those messy sort of procedural procedure plans, and I'm just wondering how, um, as, like, if we're to support this recommendation motion, um, what we would then um, do with the, the item that that is passed for this. Sure, the future, I would say that it's redundant because the board has already taken action on the item, so we just wouldn't end up on the table. Oh, so we just you see it, you see it in the agenda, okay. but it, you're not. It's just going to disappear. Okay. This is the replacement item in the agenda. It's just that the business committee didn't recommend the motion that's coming the way that that it's here. Okay. And then my follow up is, um, we can then, if I'm hearing this correctly, we can come back and return to that that initial plan after the day of the thirtieth, if all things go according to plan. Future, yes, and in fact, I anticipate that we will be in a position to do that, but. We just we want to be absolutely certain, so we're not having to try to go into our schools to make any staffing changes 
right now if I can. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Greg? Just hoping I can move the motion. Please do. <laughs> Please stop me if I start reading the wrong one because this is a little bit confusing. Uh, from the staff report, uh, the motion reads that the Board of Education of School District Number 68 and Nanaimo Ladysmith approve the recommendations contained in the Business Committee Action Sheet dated September 14th, 2022 to allocate the unrestricted surplus to support the Board's goals, except that the Board shall only transfer $1 million to local capital and the remaining $1 million be maintained in unrestricted operating surplus. Thanks. And uh, second for uh, Naomi. OK, any discussion of the motion? Uh, Stephanie? Okay. I just want to say that I appreciate um, the responsiveness of our staff to this issue. Uh, talk about a tight timeline to respond to that, and you guys were on the ball to notice it. And, uh, you know, having to pull staff out of schools and reorg classes is so disruptive. And in fact, if this gives us some room to even allow, you know, families who move into the community not to have their kids have to go to three different schools because there's no space, then all for it. This is exactly what our surplus is for, is to make sure that we're creating good, calm, educational environments for our students. So thank you for being so uh, so observant and on the ball. Thank you. I'm just going to note that there's lots of nods. I had nods around the table in agreement on that statement, so thank you. Uh, any um, questions, comments before we move to the, to move the question? There, well, the questions we move, but to a vote. Um, I see none, so I'm going to call the question on this. All those in favor of the motion? Uh, again, unanimous. That has been passed. Okay, thank you very much. We're going to move on to committee reports now. 14.1 uh, under the business committee. I'll leave this to the uh, business committee chair to talk about the exempt compensation reporting. So we have for us now two motions. Uh, if you remember, we dealt with the third one just now. Yes. So. The first one, item 14.1.1, executive exempt compensation reporting, reads as follows. That the Board of Education of School District Number 68, Nanaimo Ladysmith, received the exec executive compensation report as information and direct the board chair to sign an attestation letter acknowledging compensation paid to executive staff during the 2021-2022 fiscal year. Second year for that, uh, Chantel. Okay, do you want to motivate the motion? Uh, there's not much to say. We had our conversation at the business committee and something that we have to do. Okay. Any questions, comments on the motion? Okay. All those in favor? Okay. Approved. No one opposed. That one passes. So you know, move on to the before and after school care. Thank you. The motion reads as follows that the Board of Education of School District number 68, Nanaimo Lady Smith direct staff to prepare a pilot before and after school care program for September 2023 based on the requirements as outlined in the business committee action sheet dated September 14th, 2022 and report progress to the board prior to final implementation. Thank you. That was moved and uh, um, seconded by uh, Naomi. Um, I'm going to let uh, him motivate first and then we'll move to questions. Yes, thanks. So I'm I'm quite pleased that this motion is before us today. Uh, I know that there's a lot of work that's gone into this from staff as and uh, especially uh, acknowledge the work that we've done in partnership with our union. Um, and I'm pleased to see the outcome and what might be possible to achieve before and after school care using our own forces in the system. So I really look forward to this. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Stephanie, a question, comment? Uh, child care question uh, with child cares that are in our schools or on our school grounds because a lot of them are in buildings separated from the school when schools are required to be closed such as what just happened last week will those child care centers be able to remain open So through the chair, so the example of last week with the surprise uh, holiday, 
we actually reached out to each and every individual provider to offer them the opportunity to be open on that day if they wanted to, whether they're in our schools or not. Um, I believe that the uptake on that offer was. I don't want to say zero, but close close to zero. I get. And so we we took those steps. So um, in the case of us operating, we would that would be a consideration of what would occur. It uh, could be a it, it'll be another hiccup that actually wasn't addressed in the report about what we do in the circumstances, because of course our our uh, if it was done with our own forces, they'd have the statutory day off. Uh, and since school would be closed, the, the big question is, would we expand our service to cover the entire day or would we close, which is what all of our providers have been doing. So not something we've contemplated yet, but that will be, uh, I think it's a very good point to bring up about what type of services we would anticipate to provide. Can you? Thank you. Uh, it through the chair. I think the snow day one is actually easier because our employees can't get in and they have certain rights under the collective okay. agreement. So we okay. probably have to take the position that they're closed. Unfortunately, okay. I guess we could go a different direction, but that one's a bit easier, whereas the holiday one is it's probably more of an expense than than it is a, an actual ability to do it. Any more questions about the motion on hand? Okay, seeing none, all those in favor? Uh, passes unanimously. Thank you very much. As noted uh, on the agenda 14.1.3 surplus allocation has been become redundant, so we're just not going to speak to that. We have nothing from the Education Committee. Moving on to unfinished business. Uh, Mark Walsh, our Secretary Treasurer, is going to talk about the Environmental Sustainability Action Plan. So uh, thank you, Chair. So this evening is uh, the Environmental Sustainability Action Plan is coming back to the board following our uh, policy requirement of being out for feedback for 30 days, and it's been much, much more than that. Uh, and perhaps, the, of course, the feedback has been made available to the board, but perhaps I could turn it over to the chair of that committee to talk further about uh, the action plan and some of the feedback. Right, so here's where we dance. Uh, the chair of that committee is currently the chair, so the chair of this meeting is going to ask someone else to chair. Trusty Keller, will you step up and chair for a moment and I can go through this issue, uh, ideally to uh, move the motion as well since near and dear. Um, a brief information, let's acknowledge that this is, uh, we're at the end of a long process uh, that is, um, I believe, achieving a significant goal that we had hoped for. Um, I'm not going to go through what all that process entailed because of time considerations, but I do want to acknowledge that there was considerable consultation, right? We had a variety of processes that asked staff, asked the community, directly engaged students um, in the creation of the plan, and then afterwards sent the plan out to the community for um, their feedback. Um, that feedback uh, we had very few responses. They were overall very positive. One criticism was not inconsistent with the plan. It was simply about how we're going to meet our targets, and that was not detailed in the plan, which is indeed part of the plan itself. So um, we didn't receive any feedback that would make us uh, have any changes. Uh, just a reminder that when this came up, uh, to go out to consultation, we were inundated with letters of support. So we've had broad support uh, for the Environmental uh, Stewardship Action Plan. Um, I will note, I found just this out recently, that this the Environmental Stewardship Action Plan is being used on a website of a provincial environmental um, group uh, called the West Coast Environmental Action Network in one of their policy papers as a as a model for trustee candidates across the province about what could be achieved. So um, goosebumps there. I was very excited to learn that. Um, but I do want to take this moment just to respond to. Um, <sighs> if, you, if you allow me to respond to the question of why is it our job to respond to climate change and then I will move the motion. So I'm kind of motivating in advance, but it's not. I just want it because this has been an issue. Are we OK with that? 
OK, so because that has been one, not necessarily we haven't received much of that feedback, but you know that is kind of floating out there. Why, why is this our job? Right, so I just want to review last year. Uh, the floods of 2021 cost an estimate of $750 million, and this guys is more for the public, OK? Um, estimated cost of 700 or $675 million, but that's only the amount of money that is attributed to what was the damage that was insured. So any damage that was uninsured is not accounted for in that $675 million of one weather event. Uh, it was the most costly weather event in BC history. We had multiple school districts that were flooded and had to shut down Mission, uh, Chilliwack, Fraser Cascade, to mention um, a few. Um, one school in Abbotsford alone had $1.66 million in flood damage costs, right? That's one event. The heat dome closed BC schools uh, across the province. We didn't have the capacity to ensure safety in that kind of heat. Uh, locally, a wildfire made it unsafe for kids in that area to play outside due to poor air quality. So last year alone showed us why we need to address this. Um, scientific models, uh, which are proving true, tell us that we are going to be experiencing increasing frequency and severity of uh, extreme weather. And actual environmental change is actually happening at a faster rate than the models predicted. So we know it's going to get worse. Um, yet uh, emissions continue to increase here in Nanaimo at a rate that's higher than the population is growing. So not only do we have a fiduciary duty to ensure that our fiduciary duty to ensure I can't even talk that our fiduciary can't even do it to ensure that our schools can stay open and to limit um, risk exposure to huge costs. We have a moral obligation to ensure the health and well-being of our children's future. Um, so we the events are quite clear that we can no longer have our heads in the sand and I believe that we've learned this term that um, uh, we need to change our relationship with the land and uh, I think we all gained a deeper understanding of our interconnectedness to the land, air and water. So I'm proud of the step forward um, that we're taking for our staff, our schools and our students. Uh, I'm grateful to all that contributed, staff, students, trustees and community members that contributed uh, and I believe that the Indigenous knowledge reflected in this document offers us a chance at healing not only for the land but for ourselves too. So I hope that you will adopt or support the adoption of this plan and if I can move the motion I would appreciate that. You cannot second the motion before I move it uh, but I appreciate your enthusiasm. Um, that the board, may I chair? Yes, of course. Sorry, I didn't. I got excited. The Board of Education of School District 68 in Nanaimo, Lady Smith, adopts the attached draft environmental sustainability action plan. Seconder. Chantel. Discussion. Stephanie. Thank you. I'm assuming that you motivated. I motivated. Okay. I'm emotional. Uh, I'm, I'm really proud of us. I want to add um, to your stories of why this is our duty um, for us not to forget what happened in SD58 last year when the floods happened, where almost every single school in Merritt was affected. Students have just returned to their school and school buses were used in the middle of the night for evacuation because of the weight that they provided as a safe escape because of the speed of the water. So this is absolutely part of our Fiduciary, fiduciary responsibilities but also when we were doing our strategic plan we heard loud and clear from our students the importance of being leaders in environmental sustainability that they felt which is also connected to our goal of creating a safe and caring learning environments because our students are feeling this at a crisis level and so we have to respond to that for them and so uh thank you for all the work you did. This is your baby and I'm emotional because it's your last term. Uh, it was, this was a real labor of love and uh, you really pushed us on this. So I really want to appreciate your work uh, and your leadership on this. It's, you know, this board does work uh, really well as a collective, but you led us on this. And so thank you for all your work on this and thank you to our staff. This has also been something that our staff across the district have really, really latched onto and been leaders on. And so I'm really appreciative to how those opportunities have been um, 
been taken by staff and also provided to our students. So uh, well done, Trustee Stanley. <laughs> Uh, our staff who have led this work and it's uh, alive in the district. So next on the list is Thank you, sir. Uh, yes. Greg. And first of all, colleagues, I apologize. I keep forgetting to turn my camera on. I'm I'm rusty, clearly. Um anyway, uh well said, Stephanie. Uh, Jessica, you have done amazing work in taking the leadership in this role and in I mean I thought I understood these issues before oh, I'm muted oh I mean it's okay I'm not um see rusty um anyhow uh I thought I understood these issues before prior to, to this term and I realized how much I didn't understand and didn't know and you've certainly made me more aware and You've done it in a really good way. And I have a lot of young people in my life who are really excited that we're doing this because uh, honorary nieces and honorary nephews and cousins, and they're all like, yeah, this is that this is exciting. This is good work. That's before I say my comments. I guess I guess I'm next then. Uh, so I just want to thank uh, Jessica for her leadership on the committee. It was great to work with you on this. Um, I'm very proud of what we've accomplished here. I I see this in a couple of different ways. I see this as as moving towards our commitment of addressing the climate crisis. But I also see this as moving forward through the lens of the CETSAS framework because this focuses on the land, the people, and our interconnectedness. So it's really fantastic to see that. And uh, I look forward to how this new plan will um, ultimately influence our, our decisions at the board, our budget, you know, everything we do essentially, um, as we do through the CETSAS framework, this will be another factor. So I think it's gonna be a very impactful, positive change for the district. So thank you for your work on this. Can I close on that? Please. Do you have a question? Sorry, I'm chair. Okay. I, I just want to, just so I can close on it a little, just thank you everyone for um, letting me push you on this from the beginning um, and uh, the growth. And may I just say, uh, folks, uh, let's thank science for giving us the information that we needed and that's rooted back into education. So that's all I'll say. Let's go to a vote. Okay, so I'll call the question. All those in favor? Unanimous. Thank you. And I'll pass the chair back over to you, Jessica. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, I hear you, Tanya. Rusty has been the theme of the evening. Um, and now I'm Misty. So, 15.2 uh, port. Board governance policies. I got a little confused with the previous version of policies. Uh, Secretary Treasurer Mark Walsh, do you want to discuss this? Thank you, Chair. I can take the emotion out of the room right now. <laughs> the board is being asked to uh, pass our governance uh, policies uh, 2.5 and 2.6. Um, as you'll recall, they're um, been dropped from three policies to two policies. 2.5 uh, presents board committee's representation and annual work plan. So it essentially outlines what our committee's structures are, uh, uh, how boards become or members, how they represent other groups, et cetera, as well as how our partners work uh, with, with us. And so that there was no comments from the public on that. On 2.6 is the well, actually, sorry, I apologize. There was a comment from the public on that particular one. It was a hope that there was access to um, the, how we're maintaining our facilities, uh, like a work plan that should suggest that. Uh, so it's not quite related, I don't believe, to 2.5. It would be hinder hindrance to that. Um, you know, however, I would note there were some concerns raised about um, snow, and you'll see back in the financial um, discussion and analysis, we've made some fairly significant investments to, to up our game on that front. 
Uh, however, of course, staffing is always, always going to impact our ability to be able to maintain our facilities, I think, in a way that we'd all, all want to. Um, with respect to 2.6, uh, the main there's two the two main changes I, I would I would suggest are um, aligning the the policy more with Robert's rules. So there's a lot cut out of this policy, and so our old policy you, you if you knew Robert's rules you needed to read that policy and it could really create uh, a disparity. So a good example that's now disappeared if the board passes it is. Uh, I'd like to make an amend. I'd like to amend your motion, and then someone says, "Here you go." Our policy currently says, if it's not with the intent of the mover, like if it's against the intent of the mover, you can't amend it. That's not what Robert's rules is supposed to do. And so, a couple of times, I think we've seen, "Hey, trustee, tell me if that's what you meant by it. Does this kind of meet your intention?" Which is a very odd way to do business. As a, as a corporate board. So this example, uh, that's another example. Um, you'll see one area in red on page 203, and that uh, the chair uh, consulted uh, with Leaders for Learning, I believe, and Andy Schoen, I think, um, to talk about how we would incorporate, based off the feedback from the board, um, land acknowledgements in, in uh, the district. And rather than be prescriptive of what that land acknowledgement needs to say, it says that there needs to be one and it talks about what the purpose of the land acknowledgement is. So that's really the only change that's stemming um, from it. Uh, and then the other thing is we remove the redundancy between the difference between standing committees um, and the board, except for mm -hmm. when we specifically state, uh, because there was there's a lot of things that are just the same between both and why have a 30 page or exaggerating why have a multi, many, many pages uh, to, to say that. So uh, hopefully we will not have to put too much gloss on on this one if the board passes it as we uh, run into hiccups. Okay. And this the other purpose of passing it now is so when we can offer governance training, uh, to the new board, we're able to say, here's the document, here's how it aligns, and everyone's working from the same kind of uh, book from the very beginning. Thank you. Are you moving the motion? Okay, trustee, the motivated tr uh, trustee O'Neill is going to move that motion. Told you I'd take your Shanta? motion out of the room. Trustee. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I motivated said the motivated trustee. trustee. Oh yeah, she's really motivated. Uh, <laughs> That the Board of Education of School District 68 and Nanaimo Lady Smith adopt and receive draft policy 2.5 board committee's representation and annual work plan and revised draft policy 2.6 board meeting procedures. Thank you. Seconded by uh, Greg, Trustee Keller. Do you want to motivate that? <coughs> motivated trustee? <coughs> no, that was motivated okay. enough. <laughs> Pretty enough. Okay. Any Questions, comments, concerns before comment? Couples? <laughs> motion. Uh, we had some very good conversations about this in our policy committee. I think there are still some things that in the future I would like to, I, I think would be worth discussing doing a little differently. But I had a good conversation with uh, Charlene, with Chair McKay, about couple of thoughts that we had in policy committee and she had suggested that be, they were things that wouldn't necessarily have to be reified in policy and that we could discuss at, that the new board could discuss if they felt that they were good ideas to bring forward so with that discomfort removed that there would be that we I would my concern was in moving forward right now that we would lose the opportunity to have any new discussions about little tweaks uh, being reassured that that is not the case. I, I think this is something we should do. Okay, thank you. Uh, right. Okay, any other comments? No? Okay, all those in favor? Uh, passed unanimously. Just want to take a moment to dispel a myth. Uh, Mark, you did not remove all the, the emotion in the room. I just realized what we just did and the magnitude of what we just did in passing the environmental stewardship action plan and I don't think we've had a moment to think about it but that is almost as big as the agenda that we got through tonight <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, I got a little teary and I still am so your superpowers are not quite that strong 
Um, OK, so we have gotten through the vast majority of this. Uh, <coughs> and I am losing my voice of this agenda. Um, I don't believe we have any board motions reports uh, where it's in the information actually at 214. <coughs> I'm sorry. Um, I'm going to try to find that in this um, and. The. Excuse me, just bear with me till I get up to those pages. And there's no OK, but there's you know what I have is the. Well, all the four year information are in there, actually. That's what I want to say. I actually wasn't remembering any trustee committee reports. So if they're there, they're there for your information. They're not, but I can't find them at this moment in time, but it is on the agenda. I believe there's no questions. Um, I'm surprised we're out this early, folks. Can we have a motion to adjourn? <laughs> Come on, I'm going to let Trustee O'Neill move this motion because I know she's really excited about it. And Trustee Robinson seconded that along with everyone else, which I'm going to take as a vote because everybody raised their hand. We are adjourned at 836. Thank you everyone for your patience in getting through and the variety of hiccups and tribulations and we did some great things. Good night all.